Elise de Clorence, after you were crowned queen, you were envious of your people's worth and ability, harboring evil intentions. You committed a monstrous crime. You have been sentenced to death by fire. Dr. Song Jishun awakens from a nightmare where she was set ablaze. Only this nightmare was reality, a reality in a far distant past and a different life. She's on flight to Germany until turbulence hits, and the captain announces to everyone that the plane has taken damage and can no longer sustain flight. Everyone is in fear as they must descend for an emergency landing. The rudders explode and the people scream in panic as the plane descends. The screams intensify with people begging someone to help, but no one can come for them on this crashing plane. And all Dr. Song can think of is, am I gonna die here? This time, I wanted to be sure I lived a life with no regrets. No, more than anything, I plan to save so many more. Dr. Song was incredibly skilled, taking on surgeries and performing feats that others simply could not reach. Known by her peers as the kind-hearted Surgeon Queen, and also having doctors handwriting so bad no one else could make it out. But her skill set should never be taken lightly, as she's always in the know about the latest medical technology and has never failed a single surgery. Even when getting introduced to newer, experienced doctors, they praise in awe at meeting the Surgeon Queen. She really enjoys sweets too, as she doesn't indulge in any vices like drinking or smoking. We only have one life, and this time, in this life, she wanted to live earnestly and face everything with sincerity. After dinner with her friends, Dr. Song was greeted by a young girl who was ecstatic to meet her. She thanked the doctor for saving her mother during a pancreatic surgery that everyone said was impossible to do. As the young girl began taking her leave, she mentioned her mother had told her and her father she loved them dearly, and the words love lit up Dr. Song's eyes in a sad way because she's never said those words or had anyone say them to her. Because in her past life, the one she loved didn't love her back. Even worse, the man she loved announced in front of the people that as punishment for her crimes as Elise de Clorence, the evil empress of Britia, she was to receive death by burning. But now, leading her second life as Song Ji Hyun, this time things will be different. After dinner, she begins packing for her trip to Germany, and when she spots a book on medical terminology, she gets nostalgic. Remembering the times she was bullied for being an orphan, she didn't get the chance to experience love by a parent in this life. But she wasn't going to let the loneliness get her down. She had brought misery to everyone in her first life. But to atone for all the sins she committed as Elise de Clorence, she became a doctor and saved as many lives as she could and brought happiness to as many people as she could. She was proud of herself and happy for having chosen to live this way. But sometimes she wondered if her family was here, would they be happy to see her this way? Despite the wicked person she was, her family was always kind to her. Her father, her mother, and her two older brothers. She still missed them dearly, even in this new life. Awakening from the plane crash, it seems she survived, but her eyes stared in horror at the lifeless passengers. Despite this, she steeled her resolve and went to her medical supplies. She then hears a boy cry out over his passed out mother and runs over to check on them, promising to save his mother from dying. She successfully patches up the mother, but then she hears a man aching in pain and sees a metal pipe lodged inside of him. She doesn't have a blade handy, so she cleanses some broken glass nearby and surgically repairs the man's abdomen. She then sees the sight of rescue helicopters arriving. Looks like everyone is going to survive, except she isn't. As the blood begins to pour out from below her waist, and we see a trail following her every step. It's no good. She's not going to make it. Song falls out of the plane, wishing she could have seen her family one more time. Oh man, it looks like Palace has escaped his cage again. Wait, what's he doing here? This familiar place. A maid then comes in to tell the girl that, as of today, she's no longer confined to her room. As the girl stands silent, the maid asks, Lady Elise? And the girl stood in shock, seeing her face in the mirror. She was once again, Elise de Clorence? Elise then asks the maid, Mary, if her family is at the dinner table right now. And they are. She doesn't know why this happened, but her mother, her father, her brothers Chris and Len, she was in tears over how desperately she missed them. After telling her family how much she loved and missed them, they stared at her in visible shock. Her mother scolded the father for punishing her too severely. Her brother Chris consoled her, telling Elise that a lady awaiting her betrothal shouldn't cry in front of others. Upon hearing about her engagement, she had something to say, but her father cuts her off, telling her that her engagement to Crown Prince Lyndon de Romanoff will be formally announced at the Emperor's birthday celebration. However, 
Her eldest brother, Len, protests Elise even being a good match for the prince, realizing it's insolent of him to question the decision that their emperor has made, but he truly opposes their betrothal. Elise smiles because hearing Len's sharp tongue is nostalgic, but she agrees with this statement, as her first life was full of regrets because of her own actions. But it was her selfishness that caused the crown prince so much misfortune. She must ensure the same mistakes don't happen again. Recollecting all the events that lead to her demise, she recounts that her brother, Chris, dies in the Kusef campaign. Their stepmother, Emily, dies of illness. Then the rebellion of the House of Treston. For the crime of protecting Empress Elise, her father and brother Len are then executed. And with that, the House of Clorence is extinguished. The initial expeditionary force to Kusef dies of an unknown contagious disease, with an estimated fatality count of 47,000 people. Emperor Minchester de Romanov dies of a chronic illness. Then after the Kusef War, an epidemic spreads eastward with an estimated fatality of 70,000 people. Elise sighed because medical science isn't advanced in this era, yet so many problems come from illnesses. However, she cheers up when her maid Mary brings in some dessert. Mary gets a little flustered because she's never heard Lady Elise thank her, causing Elise to remember the wicked villainess that she was before, who got angry over the tiniest of things. And after she and her prince Lyndon ascended the throne, she became the worst possible empress, until 10 years later, she was burned at the stake. Mary then suddenly breaks the tea kettle, and in trying to pick up the fragments, she cuts her finger. Elise examines it, and with a glimmering smile, tells Mary it'll be alright as long as they rinse the wound in water. And after that, she needs to wrap it in clean cloth in a way that'll keep the wound closed, demonstrating all the knowledge she gained during her life as a doctor. Mary thanked her with tears in her eyes, grateful to see her mistress care so much about her. And this reminded Elise of the young girl whose mother she saved. Now she is certain that she wants to live in this world as a doctor, but to do that, she knows tomorrow is going to be a battle. She presents herself in front of Emperor Minchester, who is happy to see her again, with his first guard, Bent, standing beside him. As the king chattered, Elise was reminded of how kind their emperor was, even back when she was a terrible person, and yet he would die right in front of her due to what she now knows as diabetes, leaving her with the final words saying, she should become a good and praiseworthy empress. The emperor notices Elise's demeanor to be different somehow, so she nervously sips tea, hoping not to give away she somehow lived a whole nother life. Sir Bent, however, thinks she's just nervous with the emperor's birthday coming around. She grabs her dress because she knows she needs to say something about his illness. However, Prince Linden, the only man she's ever loved, arrives at the tea party. He takes a seat, glances at her, then looks away. Elise remembers once being in love with his brusqueness as well. But when she tried to serve him, he would only dismiss her, saying he only married her under his father's orders, nothing more. However, she had never given up. She had been determined to get him to love her. Now looking back, she felt stupid for trying to force things. Lyndon apologizes for his late arrival, as his discussion with the Ministry of Finance over the Kusef campaign budget ran long. Elise expressed some concern about the expedition, so the king wanted to know her thoughts. From her past life, she knows the campaign will fail, a failure resulting in a war where her brother Chris loses his life. She wonders if she should tell them, because she doesn't want to look suspicious. But with the idea of Chris dying again, shaking her to her core, she explains there is a worst case scenario, where the kingdom of Moncel from the east will join in on the enemy's side. Elise breaks down a really long explanation about how their empire will get ambushed by some guerrilla warfare. And the king is shocked that not only does Elise understand battle tactics, but she's also got a firm grasp on the relations in other countries. He finds her counsel impressive, but feels exhausted because lately he tires easily and feels ill. She learns that he's got all the symptoms, tired even after long periods of sleep, feeling thirsty no matter how much he drinks. The urge to urinate often wakes him up. She's now certain the disease he died from was diabetes. The emperor questions how she knows so much about what ails him, and she answers that she once read it in a medical text, that these sickly conditions were caused by high concentration of sugar in the blood. The emperor takes her input and will bring it to his personal doctor, Viscount Ven, which makes Elise glad because she's confident in the Viscount to figure it out. 
So now that that issue has been solved, she now has to deal with Lyndon. She announces to everyone at the table she would like to annul her engagement to Prince Lyndon. Her father gets up, confused at what is happening, but the Emperor has him hold it, as he wants to know what has changed, since Elise was the one who wished more than anything to be engaged to his son. She then responds that being the crown princess, she would become the first lady of the Empire and an important ruler. She feels too inexperienced and unfit for the position. Elise then gets on her knees, begging for forgiveness for desiring more than she deserves, bowing, ready to accept any punishment they would deal her. But the king has her raise her head, and for her to tell him the real reason. So she answers that she wants to be a doctor, showing a determined look in her eyes. The king felt her desire, especially thinking when she demonstrated her knowledge of the medical text from earlier. So he decides to make a wager with her. If she passes the exams and becomes a doctor, proving her work as a doctor is more valuable than her existence as the empress, then she can choose whatever path she desires. But if she can't prove herself, then she must put all her thoughts and energy towards becoming their future empress. She has until she comes of age, the next six months. It's a difficult gamble, but she's willing to take it on, something that no one was expecting. Afterwards, the Emperor has Elise and Lyndon take a stroll through the garden, since it's been so long since they've seen each other. As they walk, Lyndon asks why she took on such a gambit, as being a doctor is highly specialized and even with a noble rank, she'd be given no special treatment during the exams. However, Elise is aware and refuses to give up. Lyndon stares at her, shining, with her saying she's ready to give it her all to save as many lives as possible. And this even surprises and flusters him a bit. Elise then apologizes for everything, especially for always causing him trouble, ever since they were small. She had forced him into an engagement he never wanted, but he simply answered, who said that I didn't want this engagement? Which is something she wasn't expecting to hear, staring at him face to face. Back with the Emperor, Duke Clarence apologizes for his daughter's behavior, but the Emperor tells him there's no need to apologize. She's matured so wonderfully, it's even surprised him. We turn back to Elise, still apologizing for everything, saying she won't get in his way anymore and she knows that he hates her. However, he just looks at the petal on her head, taking it off and walking away without a word. She could tell he was angry, but she knew this time walking a different path would be the best for the both of them. She wants Lyndon's life to be a happy one because he's the one she loves the most. The next day, Elise is assigned to the Teresa Hospital owned by her family. She'll be working under a doctor named Graham, the youngest instructor who's also considered a genius. Elise will also go by Rose, so she won't be recognized as the Duke's daughter, but instead as a student who is recommended by a Viscount. Her father asks why she's hiding the fact that she's from their family, but she knows if they learn she's from the Clarence family, she'll be given special treatment. Chris isn't too happy with his younger sister being assigned to a relief hospital for the poor, so he'll be sneaking in from time to time to see how she is, but she tells both Chris and her father not to worry. Just like you shouldn't worry about missing my videos if you like this video and subscribe to my channel. Here, at My Shoujo Weekly, you'll find plenty of other villainous anime like this one. If that's something you like, I can for sure handle. You don't need a medical degree to subscribe to my channel. Eventually, she arrives at Teresa Hospital, knowing she must earn her license as quickly as possible and win this wager against the Emperor. We hear Graham de Fallon, annoyed for having to work with the young Rose. If she's even one minute late for their 10 o'clock appointment, he plans to toss her out. She arrives right on time, and Graham immediately judges her as she has the appearance of a typical noblewoman. Graham then begins evaluating her resume. She's not old enough to have graduated from the academy, so how has she been studying medicine? She explains she's self-taught, which makes Graham chuckle over hearing such a ridiculous statement. Just furthering his annoyment, because if this weren't a request from Viscount Kate, he'd throw her out right now. He questions her on the purpose of healing arts, and what she would do if a patient lost their life while undergoing treatment. She confidently answers, being a doctor is about treating and curing patients. Then, with her eyes closed solemnly, she tells them she'd carve their death into her heart. This gets Dr. Graham's eyes to widen. To him, it's as if she's a doctor who's faced patients' deaths many times. He then takes her to work with patients who have severe illnesses and no family left. This is a ward where patients who are beyond the primary hospital's aid stay in. Elise then asks if she'll be treating their underlying conditions or alleviating their symptoms through conservative treatments, surprising Dr. Graham again because she's asking the perfect questions. He wonders if it's just coincidence. 
He leaves her to her own devices and thinks it might be cruel to place her there, but if she's going to quit anyway, it's better to make her realize it sooner, thinking she'll only last a few days at most. The people in the ward stare in awe at Elise because she looks just like a little princess. She begins cleaning the ward as better hygiene can reduce overall mortality. So she continues to clean and mop up the place. The maids even start to help as no one has ever cleaned this ward before. But afterwards, we see it sparkling clean. We then take notice of a man groaning in pain. He had suffered injury from falling off of a roof he was fixing. Elise decides to lay him over for examination and notices he's been lying down so long he's developed bed sores. Elise tells the maids to take him to the treatment room because if he's left like this, his back may get infected and that would lead to blood poisoning. She then asks for a disinfectant solution, anesthetic, and a scalpel. And the maids are shocked to hear Elise is going to perform surgery. Elise suits up, knowing Dr. Graham will probably scold her later, but she can't stand aside while a patient's condition is worsening. With the skill set from her life as Dr. Song Ji Hyun, the surgery queen, she removes the patient's dead skin with ease and completes a successful surgery. The next day, everyone cheers at the recovery the injured man has made. He tears up a little because he was just so happy at how he was treated. Whenever he showed any anxiety, Miss Rose would always reassure him it was gonna be alright. She tells him she didn't do anything special. That's just what any doctor should do. The men then all begin fighting over who Elise is going to treat next. So she tries to calm them down because she's going to treat them all. Over at the Emperor's Palace, Sir Bent is getting pissed because Viscount Ben has no idea how to treat the Emperor's worsening conditions. Prince Linden mentions Elise's words about the symptoms of diabetes. This leaves Ven perplexed. There was a small presentation given in another nation with fewer than 20 people who know about this disease. So they send Ven off to research more detail. Afterwards, the Emperor asks his son how the Kusef campaign is going. Linden reports that what Elise had mentioned before was right, and that a third enemy nation Moncel seemed to be preparing for an ambush against them, which was verified by their intelligence bureau. The Emperor then sighs with relief, knowing Elise has saved their empire. The head doctor is pissed at Graham because he left Rose to independent study when she was referred by Viscount Kate. He then gets ordered to go watch after her and heads to the ward begrudgingly. However, he's surprised to find it sparkling, his mind blown, wondering if he came to the wrong room. He tries to wake Rose up, but the happy patients tell Graham not to because she's been working so hard she hasn't slept. Even the maids think of her as so admirable. She cleaned, she examined, and her treatments were to perfection. However, upon hearing the word treatment, Elise began to wake up to a pretty angry Dr. Graham, now knowing she was in for a scolding. Dr. Graham checked the first patient, surprised to find on his back the buildup of fluid and pus gone, with the opening of the wound completely clean. Elise reported the severe bed sores the patient had developed, and with the risk of infection, she excised the necrotic tissue. With complete skepticism, Graham asked which doctors helped her, but she confirms it was a solo job. This makes him laugh, causing her to sadden a little at his lack of belief. However, the patient confirms she did his operation on her own. So, Dr. Graham decides to test Rose. He asks the name of this patient's illness. She answers, bacterial pneumonia, given the viscous phlegm and increasing inflammation that was found during the exam. And upon hearing her answer, he simply has her return to her ward. Graham sat at his desk, pondering everything. He deliberately had Rose examine patients with difficult cases, but somehow she answered correctly every time, like a veteran doctor. He kept wondering how this young girl who had never attended the academy came off as so experienced. Is she perhaps a genius? The patients she looked after were all abandoned by the hospital, but were now happy and getting healthier by the day. Graham had wondered if he had been in her place, would he have been able to do what she did? No. Is there any doctor in the world who could do what she did? He actually smiled, looking at the joy she brought. He then invites her to a little creek. He's ready to admit defeat. He apologizes to Rose for allowing his own prejudices to see her as a nuisance. He completely judged her appearance. He holds out his hand for her to shake and blushes, while letting her know this is to seal their vow as teacher and student. And with that, the two vow to work together to save lives. Back in his office, Viscount Venn confirms the symptoms Emperor Minchester mentioned, confirming the illness to 100% be diabetes. This left him to ponder, however, which doctor would have mentioned this. He had asked many of the brightest from the Imperial Cross Hospital, but not a single one of them had referenced His Majesty's illness. Knowing whoever mentioned the information to the Emperor must be brilliant, Ben gets frustrated wondering who it is. 
Back in the Emperor's quarters, Prince Linden delivers the news that Ben is preparing his father's treatment. The Emperor is grateful to Elise. Now, it's not just the country she's saved, but also his life as well. He feels if Lady Elise were to become Empress, Britia Empire would surely be secured under her leadership, but is conflicted because if she has the talent for medicine, would it be better for her to be a doctor? Emperor Minchester then commands his son to go inspect the Pierre territory, where Teresa Hospital is. That way, he can ascertain how Elise is doing with his own eyes. Dr. Graham introduces Rose to his apprentice doctors. They're astonished to see such a young noblewoman here working at the hospital. With Graham having to go to a meeting, he leaves Hans in charge of showing her around. But Hans feels nervous about her, misjudging Rose as a girl who might faint at the sight of blood. Hans shows her around until a nurse comes to them, saying there's a patient in need. It's a man with chest pains who is having trouble breathing. Hans orders a nurse to bring an electric cardiac defibrillator and Dr. Graham. However, Elise knows this is the wrong call. There's no time to run tests on his heart. He'll die before Graham even arrives. Elise gloves up and gets a stethoscope. Examining the patient, she notices the sound of breathing on his left side growing weaker. His jugular vein was overly swollen with blood. This is definitely tension pneumothorax. Too much air is escaping into his chest and putting pressure on the heart, causing the man to go into shock. Elise then has the assistants bring disinfectant solution and an injection needle. After wiping down the man's chest, she pierces it with the needle to alleviate the pent-up air pressure. And with that, the man is finally able to breathe, leaving Hans shocked out of his mind over what he just saw. Graham makes it in to hear Elise's explanation. Air was escaping the patient's thoracic cavity, putting pressure on his lungs and heart. So she used the needle to release the trapped air. And with that, Graham understood exactly the treatment she was going for. He congratulated Rose, as tension pneumothorax could have led to death if it was not treated immediately. Hans was only surprised even more because he knew Dr. Graham was famous for never complimenting anyone. The rest of the doctors behind Graham were impressed as well, excited to pick Rose's brain, and this only confirmed to Graham that she is a true genius. Everyone in the hospital began speaking in hushed whispers about Rose, the young noblewoman who looks like she was raised in a beautiful, happy, sheltered life, but was somehow able to perform difficult procedures that saved the lives of others. But regardless, Elise couldn't ignore a patient right in front of her. Even Hans is boasting about it to his peers, blushing when his friend mentions he's smitten over Rose and her talents. He even suggests Hans ask her out to the festival. Hans agrees to the idea since, with the festival only happening once a year, it wouldn't seem weird for him to take her out. On second thought, he doesn't feel he's a good match for her sparkling aura at all, but who wouldn't fall for her after watching her skill and resolve? After hearing Rose's report on dealing with a patient who dislocated their arm, he thinks of her not only as a genius in medical arts, but someone who's mastered them. I mean, it's as if she was reincarnated with the skills of a god-tier doctor from another world. Even Graham catches himself in a daze, distracted from his thoughts of Rose. They hear cheers outside and Dr. Graham remembers today is the day of the festival. It only happens once a year, so it's something everyone in town goes to enjoy. He tells Rose she should enjoy it instead of working any overtime, and she responds by thanking him and giving him a warm smile which causes Graham to blush and look away. A nurse then suddenly barges in to tell them a patient was just admitted with a serious injury. Before them is a patient named Randall with a serious bullet wound. Graham tells Randall's friend saving him will be difficult. Since the bullet passed through his spleen, he then apologizes because there's nothing he can do to save him. Completely distraught, Randall's friend then pulls out the crest of the Imperial family demanding any method to be used to save his friend. However, Graham only looks down with remorse because there is no method in the entire empire for treating a pierced spleen. As Graham begins to decline again, Elise interjects, saying they will take on the task. The blonde man stares in shock, seeing her here, because it's secretly Prince Linden in disguise. While visiting the town where the festival was going on, Linden's guard, Randall, noticed Linden seemed unrested lately. However, it's not just lately. Linden has felt unrested for the last 15 years, since the death of his mother. He used his imperial magic to disguise himself. They toured the festival to get a good inspection of the town. They then headed down a dark alleyway as it was the fastest method to reach Teresa Hospital. 
until a robber came threatening them to hand over their belongings. The robber went in for a strike, but Randall disarmed him with a single stroke. However, Randall wasn't prepared for the gun that the assailant had in case. Lyndon is shocked to hear Elise is so adamant to handle Randall's injury, since she just came to the hospital. Graham tells her it isn't possible with how severe the wound is, but again, She's confident, telling him they'll just remove his spleen. Then it came to Graham. There'd be no need to stop the bleeding within the spleen if they just remove it and tie off the blood vessels. They can stop the hemorrhaging. Such a simple idea, yet no one has ever done it before. To Graham, the idea is revolutionary. Graham asks her who should perform this, since it's beyond even his current skills. But both him and Lyndon are flabbergasted to hear Rose, the newbie apprentice, desire to take on a surgery this difficult but she's confident that she'll save Randall. They need a third assistant, however, and with everyone else busy, Lyndon offers to help. As Lyndon watches Elise perform the surgery, he remembered when his father first announced his engagement to her. For the longest time, he thought that he didn't care about who he was engaged to, but seeing how she is now, could he be falling for her? The surgery ended in success. Lyndon, under the alias of Ron, thanked Elise for saving Randall. He then began to get up to take his leave, but Elise noticed he was pale, so she wanted to check on his temperature. But he pulled away, getting flustered, making excuses for why he couldn't get checked. He eventually ended up bringing Randall home to recover. Back at the hospital, Elise handed over her report from the surgery, and Graham was surprised at how bad her handwriting was. Viscount Ben got a hold of the report, excited to explain the miraculous, never-before-seen splenectomy. However, the head doctor from Teresa Hospital in front of him disregards it as a lie, saying the surgery simply isn't possible. But Viscount Ben claps back because this very surgery was done at the hospital the head doctor is from, leaving him to believe it must have been Graham who performed it. One of the nurses comes in, as Graham has been called for by the director to explain Randall's surgery, so he takes Elise with him as they head to the director's office. While sifting through books, Lyndon falls and Len luckily is there to catch him. Len suggests that if the prince is unwell, he should go visit the hospital. But when the prince responds there's no need to because it's just mild dizziness, he remembers Elise saying it could be a symptom of something else. When Graham and Elise enter the director's office, she notices Viscount Ben. However, when the director dismisses her as a new assistant, Ben thinks nothing more than the girl looks familiar. Not good for Elise. Ben has been performing her medical exams since she was little, but he thinks it's not possible for the wicked villainess to ever become a doctor's apprentice, and just chalks up the resemblance to Elise as uncanny. Ben then asks Graham how he performed the surgery. However, he of course gives all the credit to Rose. The director grows tired of hearing such a fabricated story, since she's in this world completely new to medicine. But she confirms the claims, saying she's always wanted to become a doctor. She studied the basis of modern medicine in this era, and her excuse for how she knew the surgery would work was that she had always been searching for better treatment methods. But of course, she can't tell them she was a god-level doctor in a previous life. The director asks if she came up with the splenectomy procedure all on her own. She did, and she even explains exactly what happened and how to do the surgery. The director still can't believe what he's hearing. This is preposterous. However, Viscount Ben is more than ecstatic, even offering her to come work with him at the Imperial Cross Hospital. After all, he just wants to see her techniques in person. The Imperial Cross Hospital is the Empire's greatest medical institution. However, to work there, she'll need to pass a medical examination, which Emperor Minchester is having Ben bump up the difficulty this year. The director thinks there's no way she'd pass. However, Graham believes she will. He thinks of Rose as a true genius who possesses greater abilities than any doctor he's ever met. He's even willing to humble himself and say that she's better than him. So with that and Rose's confidence, she's able to get letters of recommendation from the three of them to take the medical exams. While divining the hospital, Elise thinks back to when her engagement was announced at the Emperor's birthday. Back then, this villainess believed a happy future awaited her, but the person she loved never loved her in return. She had never seen Lyndon smile once. But this time, her announcement won't happen since she's chosen a different path. Ron comes to visit, and the two lock eyes, staring silently for a bit. He at first says he didn't come for any reason and tries to walk off, but Elise stops him knowing he came back for the treatment she suggested. In her office, she asks probing questions to determine what ails him. He at first thinks he's wasting his time, since the doctor at the Imperial Cross couldn't even determine his ailment. She then suddenly grabs his hand to check his temperature, and that's certainly making his face red hot. She notices his hand is a little cold, 
so she decides to check his neck next, not making the situation of his heart any better. He wonders if she's like this with her other patients. She then determines that he has subacute thyroiditis. The thyroid is where thyroid hormone, which regulates our body's fuel, is created. When the gland is inflamed, it'll produce less of the temperature regulating hormone. But it's easily solvable by just taking some medicine. But even with him taking it, she'll need him to return in three days and for him to visit regularly over the next two months. That way she can check his condition and adjust dosages if needed. So they periodically meet for Ron's treatments until their final visit where she tells him he's all good now and he almost looks disappointed that he's done being sick since he won't be seeing her anymore. However, while working in his office, feeling better than ever, he looks out his window and heads to the hospital back in his Ron disguise to find excuses to hang around Elise. After all, he can't tell her directly that he just wanted to see her face. He helps carry her water bucket and offers to help clean the hospital. However, he's never cleaned before in his life, so she offers to teach him. They get close, a uh, scrubbing together. When they finish, Elise thanks him for all the help, and she catches his heart again. He's a little saddened to hear her call him Ron, but is now just discovering how beautiful her smile is. That night, back in Lyndon's office, Len asks where he's been going lately, leaving the mountain of accumulated work behind. But all Lyndon wants to know is what Elise likes as he wants to show her his gratitude. So Len explains she likes strawberry cake, mango pudding, banana tarts, hates milk, but that's not what the prince was looking for at all. He wants to give her something worth gifting to a lady, but I thought treats were pretty good. Lyndon quickly figures out this conversation is going nowhere, since Len is someone who's always serious about working. And Tell Lynn suggests jewels, as his sister has always liked dazzly, gaudy things. But even so, for some reason, how she currently is, Lyndon can't imagine her liking jewels the same way. He tries presenting a jewel to her, but she says, no thank you. He tries telling her it's a gift for saving Randall the other day. However, she can't accept it as she only did what a doctor should do. But Ron still feels he cannot rest easy until he's repaid his debt to her. But Elise feels the medical fee was enough. However, Lynn was right. She wants strawberry cake, except her family won't let her eat it too often. Then. Lyndon mentions she likes mango pudding, banana tarts, and that she hates milk. But she wonders how he knows that. Lyndon just smiles, telling her from now on she'll let her eat as much as she wants. From the bottom of his heart, he wants to bring joy to this woman he's fallen for. At the palace, the emperor asks the director about how Rose fares at the hospital. And the director confirms beyond a shadow of a doubt, she's a genius, as if she were born to become a doctor. The director then takes his leave. Sir Bent expresses that no matter what, Elise must become the Empress and serve the Empire. He was the one who suggested the medical exam's difficulty be raised to make it hard for her to pass. He also suggests the Emperor announce Elise's engagement to Lyndon at his party, even though the Emperor had promised to wait for their wager to finish. But Bent has an important plan to enact, as we see Elise cheerfully working at the Teresa Hospital. The day to celebrate Emperor Minchester's birthday has come, with the people cheering long live the Romanovs and long live Britia. At the palace, Elise de Clorence arrives with her family to witness the huge gathering of those looking to honor the magnanimous emperor. As the Clorence family walks through, the people comment on Elise's beauty and splendor, except for one woman who isn't too happy. The festivities commence and Elise finds herself all alone amongst the crowd, even though the rest of her family seems to fit in just fine. But the only thing that's bothering her is that she wants to go home to study, with the physician's exam date approaching soon. Unfortunately for her though, attending the Emperor's birthday celebration is a duty for noble family members. She then becomes alerted that he might be here too, Mikhail. In her first life, he was her only friend. Even though her husband Lyndon would anger her with his lack of acknowledgement, Mikhail would always comfort her. Clashes with other countries aren't the only conflict in the Empire. There's the Imperial Families faction, which is led by her father, Duke Clarence, and the opposing nobles faction, which supports the Third Prince, led by the House of Child. In a pretentious tone, we hear Julian the Child say, It's been some time, hasn't it, Lady Clarence? Elise remembers now that since their families are from opposing factions, the two had never gotten along, always having fought like cats and dogs. But the biggest reason they clashed being they both had passionate feelings for Crown Prince Lyndon. Thinking back on it though, there was really no good reason for the two of them to fight. Julian gets in Elise's face, asking why she's in a daze. So Elise makes an excuse that she was just remembering a few things from the past. Because of course, she can't 
explained she was both reincarnated and isekai with all her memories from her previous timeline. Julian wonders if Elise was thinking about the time she had put a frog in her desk, or maybe at last year's feast when Elise threw Julian's shoes into a pond, or maybe when Elise accidentally spilled tea all over Julian because she saw a bug. Wait, why did the Emperor and Bent choose her to be Empress again? Now remembering just how horrible she was to Julian, Elise apologized with a deep sense of remorse. But the sight of Elise bowing really threw Julian off, making her wonder where this was coming from or if it was some kind of prank. However, Elise with her head lowered tells Julian this is no prank. She's realized how bad her behavior has been. Julian breathes a sigh and tells Elise to raise her head, even giving somewhat of an endearing look. She mentions Elise seems different somehow. They then hear one of the knights announce the arrival of Crown Prince Linden, and the people are surprised he's here on time since the prince isn't fond of celebrations. Linden looks amongst the crowd until he spots Elise, and she wonders if he's looking at her. No. In her mind, there's no way he could ever be looking in her direction. However, Julian, with hands on her heart and a face flushed, believes the prince to be staring at her. She then starts to fall over, as if just being overdramatic. But Elise checks her head and can tell she actually has a terrible fever. Elise asks Julian to lie down. However, Julian reminds her that it's a noble's duty to attend the emperor's birthday celebration. But also, she wouldn't trade her time near the prince for anything in the world. Elise knows that unfortunately, because of Julian's political position, there's a chasm between her and the prince deeper than between Romeo and Juliet. But even with her family leading the enemy faction, Julian still cares deeply for the prince. Julian as a person is both earnest and noble, someone that Elise believes would be worthy of being crowned princess and eventually the empress. Chris suddenly appears to tell Elise she shouldn't be interacting with the daughter of the child house and takes her away all while onlookers gawk at Elise, something that pisses Linden off. Len picks up on Linden's sudden displeasure, but he denies anything being wrong. Len keeps pressing on the matter, which makes Linden wonder if being dense runs in their family. Linden then spots Elise watching Julian get pulled away, and comes to the conclusion that Elise must be interested in dancing. However, she's actually just worried about Julian falling apart since she's sick. However, he's not the only man who wants to get close to Elise, as a few boys swarm around her for their chance to dance. Elise knows refusing without a particular reason would be considered disrespectful, so she reluctantly goes to accept one of them for a dance, but Linden comes in to stop it, and asks her to dance, stealing her right in front of them, something she wasn't expecting. As they move on the floor, Elise asks Linden why he invited her to dance since he'd never really given her much consideration before. She has no idea he was patient Ron during his previous visits or how his feelings have changed. So when he answered, it was just on a whim. In her mind, she gets disappointed because, of course, his highness would never actually want to dance with her. All this while he's getting shy and telling her he's glad to have helped her get away from those guys. And the people stare and comment about how the two move so perfectly together. They heard that the prince's fiance is supposed to be announced today and came to the conclusion, yes, it must be Elise. Elise remembers in the past where she had to practice feverishly to keep up with the prince's lead during dance. The first time she had danced with Linden, not being able to follow his lead was both embarrassing and frustrating to her. She would often practice so much that her feet would swell all the time. She felt it ironic that she finally used those skills today. Her mind then wanders back to the state of Julian Child, concerned for her health. Linden picks up on that she keeps looking at Julian. So he dances while slowly inching over towards Julian and her dance partner. After Julian finishes her dance, she begins to collapse and Elise catches her, scolding her for pushing herself too far even though she has a fever, telling her to go home and rest. But Julian refuses because being absent from the Emperor's birthday celebration would cause damage to her family's honor. So. Linden interjects to tell the girls to come with him, and Julian gets so excited to follow her crush. Linden leads the two to the lounge where the Imperial family normally rests, but Julian doesn't want to impose. However, Linden explains that if it's a noble's duty to attend birthday celebrations, then it's the Imperial family's duty to help them when in need. Julian takes her rest, and outside the door, Elise tells Linden she'd like to stay with Julian because she wants to look after her. Linden remarks that Elise seems to be like that with everyone, and his comment makes her a little puzzled on what he means, but he just takes off without explaining anything. Elise checks Julian's condition, and good news, she seems to be breathing more evenly. Then a woman comes in to alert them that it's time for Emperor Minchester's celebratory address. Elise remembers this older woman, 
woman. She's Duchess Harbour, who's from a great noble house in the West that's blood related to the Imperial family. The Duchess tells Elise she should head to the hall, but when her legs begin aching, Elise catches on to the pain the Duchess is experiencing. As Duchess Harbour leaves, Elise suspects she could have Parkinson's disease, a disease where nerve cells begin to degenerate and cause decreased motor function throughout the body. In her past life, she remembers the Duchess losing her life when food becomes lodged in her respiratory tract. However, the time to deal with that isn't now, because Julian has awakened. Elise escorts her to the hall, commenting that it's wonderful they'll be able to make it back in time for the Emperor's address. Julian must be so resilient because of her good daily habits. Julian gets a little flushed and thanks Elise for everything, but Elise's kind heart genuinely thinks nothing of it. She was just doing all she could. Things are sure different than Elise's past life because Julian would love to get together with her for tea sometime. The people wait in anticipation as Emperor Minchester arrives, and he praises them for their incredible loyalty and all that kingly stuff. But getting to the meat of things, he has an important announcement. In regards to Lyndon's fiance, he regrettably informs the people the lady they have chosen is not of age yet. And Elise stares nervously as she's in disbelief that they'd announce her engagement with Lyndon with her wager against the Emperor still going. The Emperor explains to the people that while there's nothing wrong with this lady not being of age yet, he does have a personal promise to them. And so the official announcement will come after Elise has come of age. The people begin to talk after hearing the sound of Elise's name. She has no idea what's going on or why the Emperor would say her name to everyone. I mean, what's the point of this in not just officially announcing their betrothal? Julian certainly looks crushed though. But with that, Emperor Minchester tells everyone to continue enjoying the festivities and takes his leave. Julian nearly faints again, but is luckily caught by Prince Mikhail, who tells her to keep his appearance quiet as he's here secretly. With a devious tone, he remarks, So, that's the girl who will become my big brother's fiance, is it? All while Elise freaks out having PTSD over the terror she experienced in her first life, standing depressed, knowing she may suffer the same fate all over again with her engagement to Lyndon basically announced. As Minchester and Bent walk together, Minchester tells him to bring Elise and feels bad for making her go through this ordeal, but he wants to answer any questions she might have. The Emperor and Elise sit across from each other, with Elise sulking. She wonders what happened to their wager, a wager that was to last until she came of age. She should still have time. Minchester confirms the wager is definitely still on, which gets her staring in surprise. But the kind Emperor wouldn't break any promises. That's why there's no formal announcement. So if Elise wins, he can still withdraw what he said. Elise is concerned for the Emperor's reputation. However, Bent assures her there's nothing to worry about. However, he doubts she'll be able to achieve proving her value as a doctor will ever exceed her value as an Empress. Minchester thinks of Elise as if she's his own daughter. He respects her determination, but in truth, he wants her to marry and support Lyndon, which is part of the reason why he announced things this way. She wonders why the Emperor cares for her so dearly. Is it because her father is an important friend to him, or because of how she acted the other day? However, she can only stare in shock. Emperor Minchester remarks, This country has many outstanding doctors, doesn't it? But you are the only one who can become its empress. Elise looks saddened as the emperor has her weigh the importance of becoming empress more than becoming a doctor. He reminds her she can be with his son like she always wanted and they can dance all they want as gracefully as they did earlier. He pleads her to reconsider. She knows the gravity of what the king is saying, but even so, she still has no intention of ending the wager here. Pallas watches Elise as she continues to study diligently for the medical exam. Her brother Chris enters her room to check on her, and even with her best efforts, Chris thinks she's pushing herself too hard, especially knowing the birthday celebrations are still continuing tomorrow. He urges her to sleep because she'll have an early morning tomorrow. But even though she's serious about continuing, Chris is just as serious about her sleeping. The next day at the festivities, Elise gets surrounded by several nobles congratulating her on her engagement to Prince Lyndon, but she isn't too excited about it. She looks up to check for Julian, asking the others about her, but no one has seen Lady Child. Elise knows with Julian being in love with Lyndon, the announcement must have surprised her. I think that's more than surprising knowing the two of you had just become friends. But Elise feels remorse and wants to explain things properly to Julian. We suddenly hear silverware drop to the ground, a man calling for a doctor, a woman had fallen, 
It's Duchess Harbor, the woman that Elise assessed to have Parkinson's disease. Elise runs over, noticing the Duchess choking with the food lodged in her throat. Elise collects herself, irrationally thinking about her next move. She tries to awaken the Duchess, only to see she's fallen unconscious and exhibiting cyanosis, a bluish discoloration of the skin resulting from the inadequate oxygenation of her blood. Elise starts to perform the Heimlich maneuver, but it just isn't working, so there's only one method for her to use. Luckily, Elise always carries alcohol-based antiseptic with her at all times, usually to prevent infections. She takes a dining knife and pours the antiseptic over it. Someone shouts at Elise, asking what she's doing, but she beckons no one to interfere so that the Duchess has a chance to survive. She points the blade, promising everyone she can save the Duchess. She plans to make an incision on the neck to secure an airway, a task that must be done within 30 seconds. She locks in and cuts. Good. She can barely see the food lodged in. She takes a straw and plants it in the Duchess's neck, now allowing her to breathe, even knocked out. Elise is relieved everything worked out. However, everyone is staring, flabbergasted. She knows there isn't any precedent of performing a tracheectomy in this world, so this is likely to become a serious matter. The knights come over to escort Elise for interrogation. She accepts, however, she wants them to also deliver a message. Because this was urgent, she didn't have the chance to move Duchess Harbor over to an operating room for this treatment. So, disinfection wasn't performed under ideal circumstances, meaning there is still risk of infection. She needs the staff at Imperial Cross Hospital to disinfect the Duchess's neck again. The knights could only react to the strange amount of knowledge leaving Elise's lips but they accepted her request. They then escort her out, and we see Prince Mikhail was observing her the entire time. Sir Bent reports that Duchess Harbor was saved from death's door, and the king acknowledges they must once again give their thanks to Elise. For now though, she's been placed in the Hundreds household, as they don't want to put her in a jail cell, but she needs to be placed somewhere. Bent is concerned about the outcome of this, because Elise's reputation as a doctor will certainly increase. Well, of course it would. She saved someone who is part of the Imperial family, which would unfortunately for them support public opinion for her to become a doctor. Sir Bent suggests they counter this by having someone find flaw in the way Elise performed the procedure, especially using an eating utensil to cut. That way, they can confine Elise to the Hundred's house, making her unable to take the medical exams. The Emperor condones this plan and offers Bent to summon their nation's finest doctors in hopes of finding this flaw. In the Hundred's house, Chris shouts at Elise, scolding her for the brash actions she took. And even though she apologizes, Chris doesn't believe her because she cut the Duchess's neck, something that would have normally put her in prison. Chris asks her if something like this would happen again, what would she do? Well, as our Dr. Villainous, if there's a patient in front of her, she will save them. Chris is ready to scold her further, making Elise a little scared. However, Len approaches more tactfully, saying he and Chris understand she acted in a way to save the Duchess and that anyone would praise her for giving medical treatment as an act of bravery. But Chris won't stop his scolding screams, saying that saving the Duchess isn't a good enough reason to endanger herself. With Chris scolding her and Len praising her, this seems to be the opposite of how things would normally turn out for Elise. Elise continues her medical exam studies into the night, getting exhausted over all the texts she still needs to read. She eventually falls to her desk into a slumber. She dreams about a time Mikhail had something to tell her, but never got his words out, only saying for her to take care of herself as he disappeared. And we see her crying in her sleep, uttering the words, No, please, you can't die. As we see, it was Prince Linden who tucked her in. He had heard she was taken into custody, so he came to check on her, but wonders what kind of dream she could be having to cry like this. She turns over in tears, and he thinks, Don't cry. When I see you suffering, I don't know why, but something in my chest tightens. A pain enough to make him break his vow to never return to this tower of blood. He wipes Elise's tears and wishes for her to dream of pleasant things. But as he takes his leave, we see Mikhail deviously saying he's never seen his older brother like this. Mikhail watches her from afar, noting the interest his brother has taken in her, thinking it's time for him to go tease her a little. With Elise lost in thought, Mikhail suddenly appears to ask what she's reading. She jolts in surprise, and Prince Mikhail apologizes, especially since this is the first time they've spoken. He introduces himself as the third prince, Mikhail de Romanov, but wonders if he should have shown himself, since he's Linden's political rival. He wonders what she'll do if she's dumbfounded in shock. However, he's in more shock to see Elise crying, saying, Mill, is that really you? He wonders how she could know his nickname, 
She apologizes, saying not to mind her and formally introduces herself. Mikhail doesn't understand, but when seeing Elise, he senses a sorrow within her eyes. He takes his leave, but he'll see her around, since he's also locked in here for stealing some of his father's drinks during the birthday celebration. So he's being confined to reflect on his actions, but Elise doesn't buy that he feels sorry at all. In Minchester's throne room, he has Viscount Ben and Dr. Graham give their reports with the Emperor and Bent astonished to hear Elise's surgery to be perfection. Ben claims he was excited to see this treatment that was so dangerous, no one had been able to test it. But Elise's medical skills seem to transcend above all current medical professionals in the nation. Emperor Minchester wonders if this was just a fluke. However, Ben was only more excited to say after reading her medical report that the positioning and method of the incision was optimal and described very precisely all while Minchester and Bent are losing it. As Viscount Ben tells the two her work needs to be published as a treatise to advance the current level of medical science. Minchester thinks Ben is off his rocker, so he asks Graham's opinion on this, only for him to confirm Elise is an absolute genius, something he'd willingly stake his reputation on. The Emperor can tell he's lost, so he orders Bent to release the girl with Ven getting even more excited because he's been allowed to speak with her about her skill set. We see Elise continuing her studies, only for Mikhail to barge in. He's bored because he wants someone to play with, and when he picks up her complicated book, she explains she needs to pass her medical exam and become a doctor. Mikhail remarks that with her becoming a doctor, she wouldn't marry his brother, would she? And with a hint of sadness, she simply answers she has no intention of marrying Lyndon. So with that, Mikhail invites her for sweets, something that Elise gulps at because there's no way she can turn them down. But alas, she's too busy studying. Mikhail supposes she can't hang with him, so she bashfully tells him, okay, just for a little while. They enjoy a variety of sweets and drinks that Mikhail stole from his father. Elise scolds him saying it isn't good for him to steal because if he keeps doing that, he'll never be able to leave this place. He smoothly replies, if that means living here with you, Lise, then it wouldn't be so bad. But Elise brushes this off since he says that to all the girls he speaks to. And then he laughs with embarrassment, wondering whatever does she mean? Oh man, he's a total playboy. The two then have a toast, and this brings back memories for Elise. They used to toast like this all the time in her first life, but unfortunately, she wasn't able to prevent his death. She knows with he and Lyndon both being princes, only one can become emperor, and that the pursuit of the throne is ultimately what will kill Mikhail. Mikhail asks her what's wrong, since she always looks sad looking at him. It's like she's experienced this all before, which gets Elise shocked hearing him say that, but he just laughs because it was a joke. He notes that she seems different, especially casting aside the position of Empress to become a doctor. He asks if she hates Lyndon. She assures him she doesn't, then asks Mikhail about his sword skills, even knowing he's traveled to other countries to train as a warrior. Mikhail says the rumors are true and doesn't believe anyone can best him in swordsmanship. So she asks why he trained in the way of the sword since as an imperial family member, he shouldn't need to defend himself. So he kindly answers, it's because he loves swordsmanship. This is the same for Elise in becoming a doctor. At first, she chose it to atone for the mistakes of her first life, but now she wants to spend her entire life carrying out the work of a doctor. Even knowing Emperor Minchester wants her to marry Lyndon and become Empress, if she were forced into that path, she'd be a bird locked in a cage, unable to pursue her passions. This is why she must win her wager. After she knocks out, Mikhail carries her to bed and tucks her in. He sighs because if he was Lyndon, he'd treat Elise with much more care. He gives her a light kiss on the forehead and takes his leave for the night as he has to be somewhere tomorrow. The next day, Viscount Ben and Graham arrive at the Hundred's house, and Graham thinks based on the report he read, Elise's abilities must be equal to Rose's. Uh-oh, I just remembered those two don't know Elise's Rose yet. Elise awakens to hear a knock on the door, and those two are surprised to see Rose here, with Elise at a loss for words. We'll have to see what happens next week, so subscribe to my channel for that. I know, I know, I hate cliffhangers, but we gotta wait until next week for the new episode. Watch this next video in the meantime, but hey, it's me. Comfy tea. I'll see you all in the next one.